Welcome, my name is Dr. Megan Nelson and this is the technique portion of an osteopathic approach to the fourth trimester. And if you're looking at Mama Monica here, uh, you're wondering why I have a pregnant woman in front of us when I'm talking about the fourth trimester. I kind of wanted to rewind obstetrically for a few moments because before we start practicing with the fourth trimester mom and um, infant dyad, I want you to know that the techniques that we're going to cover absolutely can be applied to your pregnant patients. Um, I'm gonna show you the way that I approach a patient in the late second and third trimester when they're no longer comfortable lying supine on the table, at least not for an extended period of time. And that's the point where I convert the treatment to sideline if that's where mom is most comfortable or a majority of my patients elect to be treated seated. So I wanna show you um, kind of my screening and technique in the seated position because many of the restrictions that we're gonna find and the techniques that we might utilize absolutely can be applicable when we get to the fourth trimester postpartum woman. So beginning my assessment in the seated position, I start at the cervical thoracic junction or the thoracic inlet or outlet. So applying my hands there, I can make my diagnosis because when a woman is pregnant, especially second, third trimester, that anterior shift of gravity as that fundus grows causes significant restrictions or exaggerations in all of her transition zones. So cervical thoracic junction, thoracolumbar, and then lumbosacral. So you'll see that we spend a lot of um, attention or we look in these areas because things that occur frequently occur frequently, so let's go find them. So starting in the thoracic inlet, she is currently flexed, side bent to the left and rotated to the left. Now I'm exaggerating my hand motions for videography purposes, but finding that she is there, I can choose to take her to her freedoms of flexion, side bending left and rotation left, or just the same, I could extend her, side bend her to the right and rotate her to the right and wait for um, that fascial unwinding to occur. And once I'm finished there, I will start examining her thoracic spine and her ribs. So I choose to screen with an area of greatest restriction or any sort of um, transitory motion, however you best like to screen your patients and find those areas of restriction. And now when I have found, for example, that T5 is flexed and side and rotated to the right, I can ask my patient, would you mind crossing your arms over your chest? Both arms for me, thank you so much. And are you okay if I apply an osteopathic hug? Yes. So this is how I choose to use muscle energy. I'm monitoring at my segment, but I like to hug around the patient and with her arms crossed, the breast tissue is secured and she is currently flexed, side bent and rotated to the right. So I am going to gently extend her, side bend her to the left and rotate her to the left. Go ahead and try and sit up straight for me, good. And relax. And then reposition her again into extension, side bending and rotation. Go ahead and sit up straight for me. Good, and relax. And then one more time, extension, side bending left and rotation left. One last sit up straight. And relax. That isometric resistance is for three to five seconds. And then I passively stretch her into those three barriers, bring her back up to neutral, and I can reassess. But similarly, if I find a restriction in her ribs, or even if you're not certain, is it rib five, is it rib eight, but you feel when you're doing your translation that there's not a lot of motion in those ribs, you can do what I call a broad spectrum, right? The same way we apply broad spectrum antibiotics, you can apply a broad spectrum articulatory technique to her ribs. So again, I'm gonna ask you to cross your arms over your chest for me, and I'm gonna do some hugging. So I hug, but then I'm gonna take the meat of my thumb and place it along her costal angles and begin that rotation. So I'm simultaneously pulling her with my anterior arm while I'm pushing or springing on that rib posteriorly. And you can spend more time on ribs that are more restricted and you can even guide her into some side bending to get those ribs apart and really get some good motion bring her back up and then switch. And you'll see that I tend to put a leg on the table because it gives me the mechanical advantage. I like my axilla to be on top of mom's because now if I need to compress her, side bend her, rotate her, I have great control over her, but more so she feels secure. She doesn't feel that while I'm doing all of these motions that she's at risk for falling off the table. She is secure in the front against my left arm, but also I have my knee kind of behind her uh, pelvis so that she is stable no matter whether I flex her or extend her. 
You can relax your arms, thank you. So once I've treated her thoracic cage and her costal cage, I can then apply those same techniques, muscle energy, challenge the barrier, FPR, whatever you like, for the lumbar dysfunction. So just as we examined the cervical thoracic junction, we'll examine the thoracolumbar and then lumbosacral. You can also apply BLT to her SI joints here posteriorly and get an assessment of pelvic restriction. I then proceed to the front of mom and sit in front of her, and this is where I will change my focus to her diaphragm. Is it okay if I touch your ribs right here? I will get underneath her costal margin and up, see where that diaphragm is. You can do a triplanar diagnosis or routinely do the diaphragm doming with respiratory assist, whichever technique you're comfortable with. And then I take my hands from the diaphragm. Is it okay if I hold the baby? and slide on down. So you can spend some time here doing a Leopold's maneuver, but also this is where I examine if moms have a bump that is askew, a bump that is shifted to one side or the other. Many times, if the baby is restricted to one side, there is a myofascial restriction on the contralateral side, and that's why they've chosen to hibernate over on that one side. So I'll come down and scoop what will become her lower uterine segment in her left lower quadrant, right lower quadrant, and you can motion test with myofascial um, principles the same way you would her thoracic outlet, the same way you would thoracoabdominal diaphragm. And where I find tension, I match that tissue tension and apply a direct release. And then a lot of times moms will tell us that baby shifts in the next 24 hours and that her bump comes more midline. Once I've completed with the pelvis um, from the baby standpoint, I examine legs. I come to popliteal fossa and look for restrictions. Again, myofascial release. I'll examine for tib-fib restrictions, but also I make certain to spend time looking at each mom's ankles and calves, making sure we don't have um, uh, unilateral edema or signs of perhaps a DVT, but also most moms have restrictions in their popliteal fossa that contributes to the normal dependent edema in the third trimester, and every mom will benefit from if you just want to do like a fascial spread at the bottom of her foot or some BLT for the midfoot restrictions. These come about because of the physiologic pes planus, the flattening of the foot that happens um, during pregnancy. The last technique that I like to apply is, again, a broad spectrum for the pelvis. So if the patient is seated and you say to me, Dr. Nelson, I can't do my normal um, pelvis compression test, I didn't do a standing or seated flexion test, I've forgotten how to do that, but mom says that her pelvis hurts, how do I know if it's a right anterior, a nominant, or a left out flare, for example? You can make a static structural assessment, but if you're not certain what it is, and therefore you're afraid to apply muscle energy for fear of being wrong, right, doing the wrong muscle energy, I'd like to invite you to do a myofascial release for the pelvic diaphragm, which is ubiquitous. Any pelvic or sacral dysfunction that's in existence will be improved, if not eradicated, by this. So a lot of us learn this as an ischial rectal fossa release. There is a supine technique where you can do it unilaterally. There's a prone technique where you can do it bilaterally. I favor the seated position and what this involves is I'm going to ask that you sit on my fingertips with the bones underneath your tush. Does that sound reasonable? Important that you understand that I will be in the meat of your tush and the bones that you sit on. I will not be anywhere near peeps and poops. I will not be violating you in any way, but if you're uncomfortable at any portion, you just let me know. Does that sound reasonable? Yes. Okay. So I choose to sit behind the patient and ask mom to rock one hip up, great, and then sit down, and the other hip. And you'll see that I'm coming on an oblique because I have found if you approach directly posterior anterior, it's challenging um, for you to hop onto those ischial tuberosities well because they're set in the oblique plane, but then also it's, it's more work on your wrists and forearms. So this is the optimal position, and if mom rocks back and forth and you don't feel those sit bones right on your distal interphalangeal joint of your index, middle, and fourth finger, then have her keep rocking and slowly inch your way towards those tuberosities. I would rather you approach too cautiously and be in the glutes and slowly inch your way towards um, the ischial tuberosities rather than the inverse and you've gone too far and now you need to back out. So once you're here, you're gonna curl your fingertips around the ischial tuberosities and up into the pelvic diaphragm 
and you will feel that there is tissue tension more so on one side than the other, you match that tissue tension. So this is a direct technique where you are matching that tissue tension and you stay here until it melts or there is a myofascial unwinding. And the sensation that I relay to my students, once this diaphragm is domed, it's almost as if the diaphragm is pushing you off. You get the sensation that your fingertips are being pushed back down into the table, the dorsum of your fingers, dorsum of your hands, down into the table. And then I tell mom, I'm just going to sneak my hands out. She doesn't even have to move. I just pull one hand and the other. But so that you see it, my hands come on the oblique rather than directly posterior, anterior, or out laterally is challenging for your wrist as well. Come just like this, and the sit bone will be right here, proximal to, to your distal interphalangeal joint. You curl those fingertips and match that tissue tension. Sometimes it's one side more than the other. Was that overly uncomfortable for you? Okay, great. So that's my initial approach to a late second and third trimester patient, and you're gonna see so much overlap from this as we get into um, mom in the fourth trimester. Now of note, if mom is experiencing head and neck dysfunction or she's nearing time of delivery, I will have her lie supine a lot of times with um, a left or right lateral tilt just for a few moments at the end of treatment, and that's where I will take care of um, any cervical um, dysfunctions, cranial dysfunctions, and also while she's supine, if I need to apply any um, HVLA to her thoracic cage, I cradle and do it then, and I can even put her into a lumbar roll if necessary. Thank you.